I just want to do um, a little disclaimer at the beginning of this video. It may run a little longer than I intended because I found a lot of details that I wanted to include. There will be some graphic details that I've edited down to where they're not too graphic, but there are some conversations between this man and his victims that were somewhat graphic. As it may be a little more than some people want to hear. And this is the story of a former Virginia State Trooper who catfished a teenage girl, then murdered her and her family. The State Trooper who catfished a young Riverside, California teenager and killed her family apparently bought a house just a few days before the murder occurred. According to real estate records obtained by TMC, Austin Lee Edwards, 28, bought a two-bedroom, one-bathroom house in Saltville, Virginia on November the 14th, 2022. The home was bought 11 days before he arrived in Riverside, California and killed three members of the Wynek family. Neighbors in Virginia say he blacked out the windows of the new house immediately. Officials say the Virginia Sheriff's deputy posed as a 17-year-old boy online and asked the Riverside teenage girl for nude photos before he drove across the country and killed her mother and grandparents. Six the girl was 15. He told her he was 17 and was about to turn 18. They met on Instagram in the summer of 2022. The girl lived with her mother, younger sister, and grandparents in Riverside, California. They kept their relationship a secret from her family. They would send messages through Instagram and Discord. He showered her with gifts. He sent her gifts through the mail, such as jewelry, groceries, money, and gift cards. He paid for Uber Eats and DoorDash deliveries to her home, and he helped her to buy birthday gifts for her friends. He told her that he had a good job and that he could afford to pay for all of this. But he got a little bit too clingy. He even became pushy. He was pressuring her to send him nude photos, and she told him this made her uncomfortable. She never did send him any of those photos if she did, they were never found on their social media. She broke up with him right after Halloween. She blocked him on Instagram, but he still found a way to send her a letter claiming that he was going to commit suicide. In reality, the boy that she had been talking to was actually a 28-year-old sheriff's deputy from Virginia named Austin Lee Edwards. On Black Friday, which is, we all know, the day after Thanksgiving, a few weeks after the teen had broke up with him, he drove to her home in Riverside and killed her mother. Brooke Winnick, age 38, and her grandparents, or, you know, this would have been the girl's grandparents, Mark and Sh Sherry Winnick. He set the house on fire, and then he kidnapped the girl at gunpoint. After getting into a shootout with the police, Edward shot himself with his service weapon and died. The teen was physically unharmed. New grisly details about the incident are now coming to light through a federal lawsuit that the girl and her foster mother filed against Edward's estate. They also are suing the Washington County, Virginia Sheriff's Office, which had employed him at the time of the killings. They are suing Washington County Sheriff Blake Andus and Detective William Smarr, who was the investigator who reviewed Edwards' employment application. The lawsuit alleges the violation of her Fourth Amendment rights false imprisonment, negligent hiring, assault and battery, among other charges. The teen's attorney said the damages that they are seeking are $50 million. 
The second filing is a, they filed a second lawsuit by a member of the Winnick family against the sheriff's office. The surviving daughter, this would be this girl's aunt. Her name is Michelle Blandon, and she was the daughter of the elderly couple, the grandparents, who were killed. So this would be this girl's aunt. She also filed a $100 million lawsuit against the same people, the sheriff's office and... Um, they believe that the uh, police department, the sheriff's office, was aware of his troubling history when they hired him. In 2016, Edwards was detained by the Abingdon Police Department in Abington, Virginia, after he cut himself and threatened to kill himself and his father. He told the police that this was brought on by problems that he was having with his girlfriend. The incident prompted two custody orders. Edwards stayed at a psychiatric facility, and the court took away his gun rights, which were never restored. So how he was hired later as a police officer with the sheriff's department when he had no gun rights, and they're suing this detective who was in charge to investigate his past, who either didn't find this or overlooked it and didn't inform anyone that this man didn't even have the right to carry a gun. Purry, this is the, the attorney, is arguing that Edwards should never have been hired and that the sheriff's office failed to interview the references that he gave on his resume. If they would have interviewed these people and investigated this, they would have discovered his stay in the mental health facility and that the judge had taken away his rights to carry a firearm. The Washington County Sheriff's Office gave Austin Lee Edwards a gun and a badge and gave him the authority of law. He used these things to gain access to the Winnick home. So he showed up at this girl's home and said that he was a law officer. The teenager and her foster parent declined interviews, and they did not respond to requests for comment on this article. Smar, who was the investigator investigating his background for his potential employment as a sheriff's, in the sheriff's department, um, chose not to interview his father, who he listed as a reference. Had he spoken to his father, he would have learned about his background. Potentially, he would have learned about his background. He said he chose not to interview him because it was a family relationship, and those are often not very good references um, he spoke with his previous employer, who was Lowe's, which is a home improvement store, but he couldn't get a hold of any of his other personal references. So they're saying that despite the fact that he didn't interview everyone, as he couldn't get a hold of some of his references, he didn't interview his references, he either overlooked or decided to give him the benefit of the doubt. He also sought background information from the Virginia State Police where Edwards had been employed for nine months before he resigned and applied as a Washington County Sheriff's Deputy. A sergeant with the Virginia State Police said he was uncomfortable answering questions about Edwards and why Edwards had been subjected to an internal investigation. So in addition to this SMAR, a lieutenant and a captain with the Washington County Sheriff's Office criminal investigation signed off on his employment. And in his, uh, in his report, that he gave to the sheriff's office, 
for potentially hiring this man. He wrote, Edwards has no criminal history. His past and current employers speak positively of him, as do his references. It is my belief that Edwards is hireable. So they hired him as a Washington County Sheriff's deputy, and he abused that. The most recent lawsuit answers some lingering questions about how Edwards came to meet the teenager, why he decided to kill her family, and where he planned to take her after kidnapping her. Here is an account of what transpired on that Thanksgiving holiday weekend. The teenager had Thanksgiving with her mother, sister, and her mother's boyfriend at Golden Corral. Afterwards, they went to the Marino Valley apartment where her mother's boyfriend lived. They spent the night there at his house. The next day, the mother and her daughters went to Starbucks, and they were planning to go Black Friday shopping with the boyfriend of the mom. They were going to meet back up with him and go Christmas shopping. When they got back to the apartment, Brooke got a call from her mother, who, to, who told her to take the call off the speakerphone because she needed to speak to her about something serious. The Times reported that Edwards had gained access to the home of Sherry and Mark Winnick on Price Court by pretending he was a detective conducting an investigation into the teenager. After getting into the home, Edwards told Sherry to call Brooke and tell her that he needed her to bring the teenager home so that he could ask her some questions. At around 8.30 on November the 25th, Brooke Winnick, the girl's mother, got a phone call from her mother, Sharon. She said she needed to talk to her about something very serious and that it had something to do with the girl's cell phones. A police officer was there, supposedly wanting to speak to them about something to do with an online issue and that he needed their cell phones. He needed to look at their cell phones. At around 9.40 a.m., the mother, Sharon, the, the grandmother, called her other daughter, Michelle, and said that there was a detective there who was asking about lewd photographs that the girl has supposedly exchanged with someone online and that suddenly the detective, who was actually this Austin Edwards, grabbed the phone from her and told the daughter, your mother is just upset about this situation. So apparently the grandmother calls her other daughter and says, you know, he's here, he's telling us that this young girl had exchanged some nude photos of herself with someone online, and that's what he's looking into, and that she was probably asking her maybe to come to the house, and he grabs the phone and takes it away from her. In order to keep this so-called investigation from her daughters, Brooke told them that there was something wrong with the phone and that they needed to go back to the home. Brooke then dropped off her younger daughter with her aunt. So the mom dropped off the younger daughter with her sister and took the teenager in question here back home with her. The teen said that once they arrived at the house, the mom went into the house and she told her to wait in the car while she went inside to see what was going on. Her mom, she says, had not told her at this point that there was a man there, a police officer there, wanting to speak with them about her. The teen waited in the car, but she noticed that her mother's dog was not in the window where it usually sat. She said the dog always would sit looking out that window and wait for visitors to come. The teen sat there for a while and waited and decided to go into the home. 
As she opened the door and walked inside, Edwards grabbed her by the hair and pulled her inside. At that moment, she thought this was a man there to repair a telephone. She didn't realize that this was the man that she'd been speaking to on the Internet. She saw the bodies of her grandmother lying in the entryway, and her grandfather was lying at the foot of the stairs, and her mother was lying in the floor. She saw bags over their heads, and that these bags had been taped around their necks. Their arms and legs were bound with duct tape. The teen says she started to scream. Edwards was wearing a gold police badge on his belt in the shape of a star, and she began to yell, and he pointed the gun at her and told her to stop screaming. She recognized his voice as she had spoken to him on the computer and on the phone. She asked him, are you going to hurt me? And he said, I will if you keep screaming. He then grabbed the teen and pulled her through the house. As he pulled her along through the house, he was dousing everything in gasoline. He began to light the rooms on fire. He also opened the doors and windows so the flames would spread. He took the girl back outside and forced her into the back seat of his red Kia soul. Meanwhile, the Winnix next door neighbor saw the house on fire and called 911. Another neighbor whose driveway Edwards had parked in also called the police. She told them that she had watched Edwards forcing the teen into his car. After speeding away, Edwards told the teen to pretend that she was his daughter he said he was going to take her back to Virginia. When the girl asked why he killed her family, he said, because they would report it and I wouldn't have enough time to escape. She claims that he kept his hand on the gun the entire time and that, he, that inside the car he had a large bloody knife that he had used to stab her mother. He told her that he was going to drive back to Virginia through Las Vegas and she would have to stay into she would have to stay in the back seat until they could get somewhere where they could change their clothing. The Riverside Police Department identified Edwards through interviews with neighbors. They provided descriptions of the car and video footage from their security cameras. Police determined that he was in the Mojave Desert and alerted the San Bernardino County authorities. They were able to locate his car and began a pursuit. During the pursuit, Edwards fired his gun through the back window. The car drifted off the road and got stuck on some rocks under a bridge. The police cars were then able to catch up to them. As law enforcement closed in, Edwards told the teen to get out of the car. With nowhere left to go, he turned his service weapon on himself and pulled the trigger. I don't understand why the detective who was hired to investigate potential law enforcement officers didn't find out that this man had spent time in a mental hospital which is not even necessarily reason not to hire someone, but the fact that it was a, a violent attack against the man's own father and that the, this police officer didn't go speak to the father. How did he miss or did he not miss the fact that this man had his gun rights revoked and how was it that he was able to get a firearm from the sheriff's office? And they never found this out. It's possible that this pedophile went into law enforcement because he knew that it was a trustworthy, it was a, a position, it was something that the people would see him as someone they could trust around their children. He, he may have known that Police officers often get involved in local um, 
children's athletics and different events involving children. So this could have been a very easy way for him to be able to be around young girls. I think it's kind of important to include this in this story. This is a report of the incident that took place in 2016. Through a public records request, this this is the incident report of what happened on the night of February 7th, 2016. That evening, Edwards and his father watched the Super Bowl together. Christopher Roy Edwards was the father. They drank a couple of beers, the father told the police. And later that night, he awoke to the sound of his son making noise in the bathroom. He called out to his son and asked what was going on as the door was locked. His son would not unlock the door, so he used a screwdriver to open the door and he saw his son with a cut on his hand. Christopher Edwards later told police he didn't know what his son had used to harm himself, but he had knives and a small hatchet nearby. So he thinks maybe he had cut himself in the bedroom and then gone into the bathroom and locked the door. Christopher Edwards called for an ambulance while his son went to his bedroom and sat on the bed. He kept opening and closing a pocket knife. When he told his son that the ambulance was on his way, Edwards tried to leave, but his father subdued him and made him stay until the ambulance arrived. Christopher Edwards could not be reached for comment on this article, but emergency medical technicians discovered that his father had held him down until they arrived, and the EMTs said that he resisted medical aid and tried to escape. His father asked for police assistance. When police arrived at around 3.30 in the morning on February the 8th, 2016, they found a large presence of blood inside the home. Edwards could, um, Austin Edwards continued to resist authorities. He refused to let EM EMTs treat his injuries, and he continued to try to uh, struggle to get away from his father. One officer offered one officer ordered Edwards to show the cut that he had, and he began screaming and threatening everyone. According to the officer's account, the officer took out his taser and told Edwards if he did not calm down that he would use it on him. Edwards begged him, was yelling at him, please, please use your taser on me. He pleaded with the officer, but his father pleaded with the officer not to use the taser. He said, I can get him under control. He got his son down on the ground and an officer and an EMT crew member that were able to, to get the handcuffs on him and handcuffed him to the stretcher. He was then transported to Johnston Memorial Hospital where he was treated for an apparent serious cut to his left hand. He told officers as soon as they freed him from the handcuffs, he was going to go kill his father and himself. Police said that Christopher Edwards had bite marks on his arms where his son had tried to fight him to get away, but he refused medical treatment. He told authorities he didn't know why his son had harmed himself, but said it could have something to do with problems with his girlfriend. Because of the suicidal and homicidal statements, an emergency custody order was issued. Edwards was transported to a local hospital where medical professionals assessed whether he met the requirements for a temporary detention order. The record indicates that the order was issued at around 10 a.m. on February the 8th because there was a substantial likelihood of mental illness and that he may harm himself and others in the near future, that he lacked the capacity to protect himself from harm, and that he was unable to provide for his own basic needs. The order said that Edwards was in need of hospitalization and treatment. Edwards was transported to Ridgeview Pavilion, a psychiatric facility in Bristol, Virginia. 
it says here that the department, the Virginia State Police would not discuss this as they were barred by law from discussing confidential records. So they didn't find this when they hired him either through the Virginia State Police or the Washington County Virginia Sheriff's Office. Neither one of them found this, and if they did know about it, they overlooked it and hired him anyway. Um, officials from the two agencies said none of Edwards' prior employers had disclosed issues with him, saying that he was a good employee, but he had worked at Lowe's. He hadn't worked as a law enforcement officer. Um where he was going to be dealing with people in situations similar to what they, they had to deal with with him in that incident. How was he going to handle something like that as a police officer? They did fingerprint and basic criminal history exam and a psychological test during the employment. So, pre-employment. He, he was given a pre-employment polygraph. But they didn't find this, and they said there were no indicators of concern during his time on the police force. Keep in mind, he worked for the Virginia State Police for maybe eight months before he resigned, or there was some internal problem, and he was let go quietly, whichever one it was. He was only with the Washington County Sheriff's Office for a matter of a month before this happened, where he went to California and killed these people. He entered the Virginia State Police Academy on July the 6th, 2021, and he graduated um, on January the 21st. He was assigned to Henrico County, Virginia, that is in the Richmond Division. He resigned from the Virginia State Police on October the 28th and started as a patrol deputy with Washington County Sheriff's Office on November the 16th. Less than two weeks later, he would kill three people, burn down the home, kidnap this girl, and then turn the gun on himself. Now there's another article about a young woman that he had gotten involved with before all of this. And this all came up again for her when this when she found out about this. I didn't intend for this video to be this long, but there was more parts to this that I thought needed to be included. Now, as the story came out that this Austin Lee Edwards, this cop, went to California and murdered these people, kidnapped this girl that he'd been catfishing online, it came out that another woman came forward and said the same thing had happened to her. She was only 13 years old when she met Austin Lee Edwards on the internet. A woman says the same Virginia law enforcement officer catfished her online and groomed her when she was only 13. I felt so sick seeing his face, she said, when it came up in the news. This guy stalked me when I was just a child. The woman told the newspaper that she cried when she read the article, and seeing Edward's face again after having video chatted with him dozens of times when she was a teenager. They lived in two different states. She said that they met on a platform online, and it was a video chatting platform that randomly pairs one or more users. This was in October of 2014, she was 13 years old, and he was then 20 years old. They exchanged Skype and began to communicate on that app. The conversation, she said, almost immediately turned sexual. Edwards demanded that she show him photos of her breasts. The woman provided the Times with almost 4,000 messages that show Edwards pressured her over and over into sending nude photos of herself, even after she told him she was only 13 years old. She said that she ultimately gave in and sent him photos. 
She said that Edwards asked her to do other things on camera and asked her to undress and other things that I'm not going to mention here, but you can probably guess. Um, the conversations continued for about two years. The woman told the Times that Edwards would sometimes mention his father and talk about how he would he hated his father and that he would intentionally go without eating to um, stress his father out and, and just things that he would do to upset his dad. He threatened to kill himself. He, he told the girl that he would kill himself if she ever stopped talking to him and that during their conversations on video he would pull out guns and knives. In January of 2016, Edwards asked to come and see her, saying he found round-trip tickets and asked if she could leave the house and meet him. She was 14 at this time. Less than two weeks later, on January the 27th, the girl told Edwards she wanted to stop talking to him. He pressured her to stay in the relationship, and she ultimately re relented. At one point, he wrote, Don't do that again. Don't ever hurt me like that again. Four days later, he tried again to pressure her into letting him come and visit. He told her that nothing was going to stop them from being together. On February the 7th, Edwards told the team that he wanted to kill himself and that he had cut himself. Now, he was on video chat with her while this was taking place. He was in the bathroom. He showed her the cut to his hand, and she was on the phone with him, actually, when the father was outside the door trying to get in. And so her account, what she told, matched up with what the father and the EMTs said happened in the house that night. He had locked himself in the bathroom, refused medical care, and eventually he was... The father told the police that he was having problems with his girlfriend. Now, this was this 14-year-old girl that he was talking to at the time. <clears throat> After he was released from the hospital, he sent the girl a message. He told her he had been released from the psychiatric facility after two days. He said that he knew how to get around those places and that he was able to get out of there. He was, while he was in the facility, the judge barred him from buying, owning, transporting firearms. Now, this was where this lawsuit comes in later from this California family. After this incident, the woman said that she stopped having regular communication with him. He continued to try to reach out to her, but she blocked him in September of that year. This is when she was turning 15. He told her that it was okay that he had a new girlfriend anyway. She said he started sending her messages on Facebook from different accounts, that he would make up new accounts and send her messages. She had told him her legal age, and he knew her age. And when she turned 18 in 2020, she said that he even called her, but she didn't pick up the phone. He reached out again to her on Facebook, and she told him to never contact her again. The woman said that she had been keeping all this a secret from her mom and other loved ones for years, but after the tragedy in Riverside, it inspired her to come forward and tell this. She had kept all the messages between the two of them as proof and had video clips of the two of them talking Um he had attempted to go and probably would have kidnapped her if he had been able to get access to her. And she probably feels very lucky right now that she didn't agree to meet up with him because she would have been his victim. The woman said that she came forward to share her story because she wanted to educate other young girls and other young women out there about being groomed and solicited for sexual images. And not only did he ask her for explicit images, he asked her to take part in 
um, video, basically child pornography, because he knew that she was only 13, 14, 15 during the years that he talked to her and asked her to take part in that type of thing uh, on Skype. And she refused. The second girl refused to do this. The first girl did take part in sending him explicit photos of herself. She said that she, keep in mind, this was a 13-year-old child who was keeping this secret from her parents. She was being groomed by an older man. And he told her his age because when they first started chatting, he asked her if she went trick-or-treating. And he, he told her that he was 20, but yet he still went trick-or-treating. She said, yeah, I went trick-or-treating too. I'm only 13. So he knew her age. She never tried to hide her age from him. And he never tried to hide his age from her. He had to know at the age of 20 that what he was doing was wrong. And... Um, So here are a few of the, the text messages that she saved. And this is a little graphic. Um, he told her that he wanted to see her tits. She was 13. Keep that in mind now as you listen to this. Yo, what the F I said? I wanted tits waiting on me when I got back. Where are the pics? She replied that she was sorry. He dropped homophobic and racist slurs. He said, you're black, right? I have jungle fever. Let's do this. She said, I was not, I didn't understand because the girl that he was speaking to was white. He must have either mistaken her for another girl that he was speaking to, or in one of her photos, maybe he mistook her for black. But she said she didn't understand what he meant by that because she was a she was a child. She said that as soon as she would get home from school of the day, he would be waiting for her and want to video chat. She said that he would go from being very depressed and talking about being depressed and suicidal and sad, and then the next moment he would be asking her for nude photos. This was a grooming tactic that he was using to get her sympathy, to keep her chatting with him. He would um, threaten suicide if she said she couldn't talk. And he would talk about being poor. He said that he would... Um, he had a lack of money, so he would intentionally starve himself and would complain about being hungry. He would send her photos of ramen noodles and tell her that that was all that he had to eat. This was another tactic that he was using to gain her sympathy. And then he writes to her, My first thought in the morning is of you. I go to sleep at night thinking about you. It's nice having someone that I love knowing that you love me back. You're the best thing in, that's ever happened to me, he says. There's not an obstacle out there that's going to stop us from being together. It doesn't even matter if you're 14. On February the 7th, 2016, Edwards told the girl that he wanted to kill himself because he loved her and that he wanted her to video Skype. On video chat, he began crying and was drinking alcohol. Now, this keep in mind, this was the night that he and his dad had this altercation. It was the night of the Super Bowl. This was the night that his dad had to call the cops, and they took him away and put him in psychiatric, um, evaluated him, and within a few days, he was released. Now, this was the reason his dad believes all this was going on was because this girl wouldn't take part in these video chats and that she was telling him that she no longer wanted to continue to talk to him. His dad even told the police that he was having trouble with his girlfriend. 
Was his dad aware that the girlfriend was only 14 years old? Would his father have said to the police, He's chatting with a 14-year-old child who doesn't want to send him nude photos and videos. And if that had been the case, this whole story may have turned out different. Austin was really good at manipulating people, the woman said. I'm sure that he, the people who knew him in person had no idea what he was really like. I'm just glad I no longer have to keep that secret. She came forward and she began to talk to other teenagers about online safety and what to do if they're approached for nude photos, nude videos, if they're approached by an older person asking them for these things. So the fact that he became a police officer after starting doing all this online says that he really wanted a, to have authority over people and he probably attempted to molest other young girls maybe he did and got away with that i don't know the notice of claim letters were filed on behalf of the teen's legal guardian and a sibling by a manhattan beach attorney and served to the commonwealth of virginia and the county of washington county virginia the documents show the filings indicate the family is claiming they have suffered at least a hundred million dollars in damages. According to the filings, Edwards was hired by the Virginia State Police in January despite failing a mental health evaluation. He was ordered to undergo an evaluation after he disclosed he had voluntarily checked himself into a mental health facility in 2016. After he deliberately cut his own hand and threatened to kill his father, the Virginia State Police deliberately buried the results of his mental health eva examination and did no further investigation into his mental health before they hired him. The Virginia State Police later claimed the hiring of Edwards was due to human error which could not have been further from the truth. The filings state that under Virginia law, Edwards should not have been allowed to handle a gun, but he was given a service pistol by the Virginia State Police. After he resigned from the Virginia State Police in October of 2022, he was hired by Washington County Sheriff's Office as a deputy. They also knew of his past history that they obtained from the state police. Police said in a statement in the wake of the crimes, as a probationary employee, Edwards was also given a monthly performance evaluation in accordance with the policy of the department. During his short tenure with the department, he never exhibited any strange behavior that would trigger an internal investigation. The Washington County Sheriff's Office said that Edwards had started orientation only a week prior to the incident. It is shocking and sad to the entire law enforcement community that such an evil and wicked person could infiltrate law enforcement while concealing his true identity as a computer predator and murderer said Washington County Sheriff Blake Andes. Basically, it's just believed by the friends of this man, this Austin Edwards, that he was seeing a woman or he was having an online relationship with a woman in California who would have been around 25 years of age. Now, whether these people were aware that he was catfishing this young teenage girl and maybe he was actually telling them that she was 25 when she, in fact she was 15. The friend Tommy Gates declined to identify the girlfriend but said the two had met online. He believed she was two or three years younger than Austin Edwards. The home that Edwards had recently purchased in Saltville, Virginia in southwestern Virginia was intended for the two of them to live in. Edwards had been dating the woman for at least five years said another friend or was using this young child, this 15-year-old girl, 
to claim to be this older woman. I don't know, but whatever this, the situation was, he drove across the country, giving him days to think about this. Walked into this, these people's homes with his uniform on, saying that he was invest in some type involved in some type of police investigation, and then murdered these people. Edwards had traveled to California because he had some vacation time for Thanksgiving coming up, said a close friend of his. He decided to go up and see the woman that he had been dating since he would have just enough time to drive there and back before returning to work on Monday. It was his first time to visit the girlfriend whom he played League of Legends and Minecraft with. They're saying that was the, his intention was to go there and meet this so-called supposed 25-year-old woman he was dating through these Minecraft games and um, bring her back to Virginia with him or he was just going there for a visit. The second friend said he learned of it from Edward's father. See, he told his father and his father was looking for him, trying to get in touch with him. And maybe the father reached out to the friends and said, have you talked to him? Because he's told me he's going to California to meet this woman. Well, I believe the woman, the, 20, the girlfriend, was this young teenage girl. The last time Gates saw his friend Edwards was in early October when he visited him in the Richmond area. Edwards, who graduated from the Virginia State Police Academy, was working as a trooper in that county in the area that surrounds the state's capital. The two went to a Renaissance festival in Maryland, and he said that Edwards seemed very happy. I don't know what was in his heart, but to other people he was, act, he was acting cheery and happy. Before joining the academy, Edwards had dropped out of high school in Richlands and earned his GED. He worked at Walmart and Lowe's and attended a Southwest Virginia Community College. Um, in 2017, he graduated from Southwest Virginia Community College. He, um, he worked at Walmart and he was a comic book type person, they say. He was really into these comic book events. He liked to go to Comic Con and those types of events. He was in the lower income level than your average people around here, said his friend who lives in Tazewell, Virginia. Austin said that's why he wanted a better job and wanted to get his family more respect and out of poverty. Yes, people can change and people can overcome problems from their childhood or uh, earlier age, but something like that is not the type of person you want in law enforcement carrying a gun. And we all see what happened, what he ended up doing. And I said earlier in this video, it's my belief that he wanted to become a law enforcement officer so that he could have that type of authority over young children, young girls. He could use that badge as a way to gain entry into their home and their lives and use that authority to coerce them into doing things with him. Um, uh, that's my belief that that was the only reason that he wanted to become an officer. The lawsuit says they ignored a, a lack of response on the application to a number of questions. So on his application for employment, he did not put down whether or not he had a permit to carry a gun and whether or not he had ever had a permit revoked. He also failed to answer the question of whether he had ever had a civil restraining order or an order of protection filed against him. He left those blank and he was still hired. 
Edwards began training as a sheriff's patrol deputy on November the 16th, 2022, seven days before the murders. So he got the job with probably the intention of going there to kidnap this girl, maybe in his mind and believed that he would be able to get away with kidnapping her because he had this badge. This man murdered three people, burned their home down, turned the gun on himself, committed suicide, kidnapped this girl before that, and um, left her and her sister without a mother, without their grandparents. And the police missed these background. They, they, they either missed this stuff on his background check or they overlooked it. The one thing that concerns me that I'm, that I'm looking at here is on the job application that he left out two very important issues, whether or not he'd ever had a restraining order filed against him and whether or not he had the right to own a gun. He left those blank, and they still hired him. This should have been reason for them to bring him in and sit him down and ask him, why did you leave these blank? Is there something you need to tell us? So I just wanted to talk about this story. I don't know how this lawsuit will turn out. It may be settled in a private um settlement that's never talked about publicly and the public may never know this is not typically the kind of story that I talk about I usually talk about people who go missing and are never found or you know murders that are not solved but I wanted to talk about this because cyber crimes against children are bad enough it's 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 bad enough that young children are being are on the internet and are subject to maybe being lured by predators but when they are a police officer not just pretending to be one but they really are an officer of the law and they use that authority they really really need to do not only background checks on them as they hire them, but throughout their career, they need to do. And I think a lot of the reasons why they don't always catch this stuff is because of lawsuits, and they don't want to be, you know, they don't want to put that information out there. Thanks for watching.